Hey guys, all right, welcome back. We're still in Genesis. We'll be there for a long time. We are on chapter nine. Let's look at verse one. It says, And Elohim blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and increase and fill the earth. Well, there's your Genesis 1, 28 that was told to Adam when they were created. We still have um, parts that are pointing us back to creation, to the first creation in Genesis, right? So he says, be fruitful. He blesses them. That's the same time. Remember the first blessing ever in chapter one had to do with multiplying, increasing. The word bless means to take a knee, to kneel down, to stoop down, to bless. Think about this. God is blessing, man, he's blessing Noah. He's stepping down and giving the gift that he has to create to Noah and mankind and saying, okay, be fruitful and multiply, just like he did with Adam and Eve. Go ahead, use this. Use this gift of creation and continue what I've started. Noah and his sons and their wives are in the same position. They're going to be fruitful and multiply the earth. It says in verse 2, And the fear and the fear of you and the dread of you is on every beast of the earth, on every bird in the heavens and all creeping things on the ground, and all the fish of the sea into your hand um, they are being given. Well, again, at the end of chapter 1 of Genesis, what does the Lord do? He blesses them, tells them to multiply, and he says to Adam, they're in your dominion, right? These animals rule over them properly, rule over them. He's given the same command to Noah, telling them that you're going to, you know, he's giving them, it says, into your hand, they have been given to you, all right? Now let's look. Every creeping creature that lives is food for you, and I have given all to you as I've given to as green plants. Now let's think about this. All the animals are on the ark. They're all hanging out together, right? Now they're released, again, of wild beasts, of animals that you don't eat, there's two of each, okay? Of the animals we do eat, there's seven of each, which means there's 14. There's 14. So the Lord already brings everything that's going to be offered to him and everything that's going to be eaten, everything that was domestic, like, you know, your cows, your sheep, um, your goats, those things, are two by two, I'm mean, excuse me, are seven by seven, all right? So those are 14. They're already going to increase at a greater population. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Faster. That's what I mean. Now think about it. Even though the Lord right here is saying you can eat, he's still saying every animal needs to be afraid of you. They won't scatter if they're not afraid of man. They're going to all hang out. I mean, they've been getting fed for a year there, right? They feel very comfortable near the ark. So the Lord's pushing them away to get them to move out and to start increasing, right? To start multiplying and filling the earth. Move on out. You know, we're going to see this again after the Tower of Babel. The Lord's like, mm, you guys move out. He wants to scatter across the earth because then you can pull back. Same idea. Well, the oneness idea that was in Adam, remember, and Eve was pulled out and then to bring them back together as one, it's kind of the same way here. Man's going to scatter out and then be pulled back in into Israel. All right. All right. Let's continue to look. Um, it says, but do not eat the flesh with its life in it, its blood. Okay. There is always the discussion of, well, see, right here we can eat whatever we want to. It doesn't matter. And the word for every creeping thing, it means moving thing, which is remez. And there's several different teachings about that word. But let's stop and look. Before the flood, the Lord already had separated clean and unclean things. We know that the Lord, we know that our God, the living God, is the same yesterday, today, and always. Which means he's never created something given as a, you know, said, here's this, and then said, oh, no, 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 now it's a sin. Now it's against me. So if, if the point is right here, anyone, Noah, you're a righteous man. You can eat whatever you want to eat. It doesn't matter. Kill whatever you want to. Well, my goodness gracious, that immediately puts everything that's two by two in danger. 
because all you have to do is say, well, I want to eat an elephant. I want to eat a rhinoceros. I want to eat a giraffe. There's no mating. And he doesn't say, uh, wait a few years before you can eat it. He says, now you can eat it. If there are pairs of seven, if there are 14 of all the clean animals that you can eat, then if they decide to eat one, now obviously they're not consuming meat like we would think of today, but if they decided to eat one, then they would eat it and there's still enough to continue to populate. But I'm gonna throw this out there. This is at the end of the creation. This is recreation, um, renewing of the earth. And he's blessing them and he's about to go into covenant. Well. When you go into covenant, it is a meal is shared. The, the table, the, the altar is considered like a table. We know in the beginning, excuse me, at the end of chapter 8, there was an offering given to the Lord, right? And it was a burnt offering, an ascent offering, which means all of it went to the Lord. None of it went to man. Noah and his children, no one ate any of it. But when you have a covenant, you share a meal. In Leviticus, we see this in Leviticus, I believe it's 2 and 3, where a part of an offering that's given to the Lord is also eaten by man. A Thanksgiving offering, okay, a vow. When you make an offering to the Lord, you keep a peace, and the Lord has a peace, and you're sharing together. The peace offering, the Passover lamb, that's a peace offering. Man eats a part of it, and they eat a part of it, okay? And they that was crazy. Well, that's the priest, but sorry, I wasn't thinking. And the Lord. Right now, we're just talking about man and the Lord. And a priest is involved once we have the tabernacle. We'll get more into that in Leviticus. But anyway, at a giving of a covenant, making a vow, making a covenant to each other, um, you're going to share a meal. So we're talking about food, okay? And then he's going to talk about this covenant. And I think that's really important because what you're going to place before the Lord is only going to be a clean animal. So if he's saying now you're going to eat, you can partake in these things. Let's say in clean animals. Now you're going to put on the altar and go into covenant and eat a part of what you're giving to the Lord. Okay? You're getting to participate in that. So I would suggest that at this point that there's an understanding that every living thing, meaning that's what food is, meaning what the Lord has provided. Okay? what the Lord's provided for them to eat by bringing seven of each item. All the other animals are going to run for the hills. It's actually a protection mechanism and forcing them to move out to continue to multiply. So it says, but do not eat the flesh with its life, its blood. Now we talked about that. The blood is that life, right? It's going to go up in that offering before the Lord and represent man. In verse 5, but only your blood... For your lives, I will require from the hand of every beast that I require it, and from the hand of every man. From the hand of every man's brother, I require a life of man. In other words, if you decide that you're going to play God and you're going to kill a man, then you're going to have the consequences. And that consequence is you don't have a right to play God and kill a man. Therefore, you must die also because the living God is going to allow you to die. Okay? That's what's the consequence of that. And again, I'm not talking about in battle. I'm not talking about self-defense. There are reasons that death happened. I'm talking right here about killing, murdering. And let's think of this. This again is with food. Do not eat man, okay? Man is a walking thing. Don't you eat a man. No, 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 no. If a man kills a man or a person, you know what I mean? A person kills a person, blood's required. And an animal that kills a man, that animal's required to be put to death. We're going to see that in Exodus. When a man or a person, and when I say man, I mean mankind, okay? So I just want to make sure that's clear. When a person kills or is killed by, the one who sheds the blood is responsible, okay? So that animal has to be put down when it harms a person. Because, again, animals, people, I'm sorry, but people, I'm not sorry about it, people have a higher, um, are higher up on the scale. <laughs> They're closer to God, right? We're made in his image to walk out who he is, not an animal. Um, I wanted to go back one more thing about the eating. So, again, we have this, uh, if we, I'm choosing to see this 
as he gives us clean animals to eat. This is what you eat. From that is a perversion later where you just eat whatever you want to, okay? And that's why in Leviticus, when it goes back in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, when it goes back and says, hey, if you choose to walk in my ways, then here's the way I want you to eat. He's bringing them back to how he gave to Noah, the righteous one. Okay? All right. Now let's move on. Back to the blood. Verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood um, by man, his blood is shed. For in the image of Elohim, he has made man. There you go. Again, that's back to Genesis 1, 26. They made man in their image, right? All right. We're still in the whole Genesis 1. Verse 7. As for you, be fruitful and increase. Bring forth teemingly in the earth and increase in it. Okay. Death is the opposite of life. Do not kill. We want to create life. That's what we're told to do. So killing is absolutely the opposite of what we're commanded to do. To create life. The gift he gave us to create life, when we kill, we are not just not doing what he said. It's complete opposite. It's taking away from the gift that he's given us. Verse 8, And Elohim spoke to Noah and to his sons with them saying, So Elohim, he's speaking to all of them, like the creator. He's talking to all of them, okay? He says, and I see, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. I want you to know that before the word covenant in the Hebrew is the olive tov. Remember we talked about the olive tov, which represents the beginning and the end, right? It's the, the olive is the mighty, the strong, and the tov is the covenant. So in front of my covenant is the olive tov because Messiah is the one who's going to be the fulfillment of this covenant. Every covenant builds on themselves. And so it says, um, I'm going to establish my covenant, covenant with you and your seed. Now remember, in Genesis 6, 18, he tells them that. So let's continue. And with every living being that is with you, of the birds, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth that's with you, and to all that go out of the ark, to every beast on the earth. So this covenant he's making with all life that's come out of that ark. And I shall establish my covenant with you, and never again... In all flesh, cut off the waters of the flood, and never again is the flood to destroy the earth. Oh, snap. Do you remember last week I said maybe no one even knew? Maybe they were afraid of rain. Or well, there you go. Not so. That's what I love about you can talk about things and go back and see where the word contradict, not contradicts, confirms. So basically, okay. He did. He told Noah and his kids this. What he thought in his heart, he held, and then he and then he presented it. So Noah and his kids do know about this, that he's never going to flood the earth again. I still think there'd be flashbacks about rain. But anyway, especially with the animals. Who does he tell this to? He tells this to Noah and his sons. And Elohim said, This is a sign of the covenant in which I make between me and you and every living being that is with you for all generations to come. I shall set my rainbow in the clouds and it shall be for a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Not just Noah, but the entire earth. That means when an animal sees it, that means, uh, it's weird to think of when the grass and trees see it, because you wouldn't think they have eyes, but they're aware of their creator. Because even... All of nature sing in harmony the praise of their creator. All right. Stars refuse to shine our rebellion because they know their creator. Psalms 19. All creation sings. The stars speak of the plan of God and testify to who he is. So if they're doing that, then that tells you they all are aware of their creator. So what a great thing he provides a sign. Now, like we talked about before, it's very possible when the rain stopped that that's when the first rainbow showed up, which would have been during the Festival of Lights, during Hanukkah. I do truly believe that. But now the Lord's saying, this is why I put that there. You know, maybe he's seen it. Maybe he hadn't seen it yet. I would think probably he has seen it. So here it is, and he's like, oh, that's what that's for. Oh, okay, all right. Or maybe the Lord shows it, and then he's like, well, it's beautiful. That's what it's for. But regardless, he tells them that's what that rainbow is for. It's to remind you, I will never destroy 
all of flesh again. Let's go back to this covenant idea. So this covenant he's making with all the earth, he's, I'm suggesting that a part of this covenant is they are sharing a meal, okay? They're sharing um, what's on the altar with the Lord. And that's the concealing, uh, not concealing, the, the sealing of the covenant, that they both agree. All right. Wow. Noah doesn't really have anything to agree to, <laughs> but he sure is agreeing that he likes the idea that the Lord's going to not uh, destroy them again, right? <laughs> However, he is, I would suggest, possibly agreeing to not create death. You know, in the flood, the Lord killed, right? Because he had the power to destroy everything. And he's reminding man, you don't destroy, you create. That's what you're going to do. You're going to create. And it's interesting that the rainbow today does not represent what the Lord had it set up for. Man's taken it and perverted it, right? Just like I would suggest man took the idea of you can eat anything and perverted it. Oh, here's a great example too. In the New Testament, uh, Mark 7, and there's other verses off the top of my head I can't think of, where it says all is food. That all that's food is not, it doesn't say all that's food like that. It's, it's in italics. But let me put it this way. When the Bible, when Jesus, when they discuss food, food is in a category, Leviticus 11. So example, if you live up north and someone talks about crawfish, up north they're like, oh, that's not food. But down south they're like, oh, absolutely. Yeah, we eat that but they don't eat it up north. It's not considered food to them. Um, I can't remember. Somewhere in Africa, they, they eat monkey brains like while the monkey's still alive. That is not food to me. So when you call that food, I'm like, mm, -mm that's not food. Mm -mm. Something plastic. If someone calls that food, it's not food. So when we talk about food, it's whatever you recognize as what you can eat. That's what's called food. And anything that's outside of what you eat is not called food even though it might be edible. Crawfish is a great example, or crawdads, some people will call them. Same thing's happening here. The food is in a category. So when he says you can eat these things, it's in the category of understood what we can eat and what's been provided multiple seven times two of the items that we can eat because that's what God eats. And if we're made in God's image and he wants us to represent him, then we really are just going to eat what, he eats because it's we're supposed to be in the same body, right? If I'm going to be in the body of Jesus, then I want to do the things that Jesus wants to do and did, right? All right, just something to mull over as you as you look at this. So back to the rainbow. Today, the rainbow really and honestly is used. I would say it's been usurped to represent everything absolutely opposite of what this rainbow is supposed to mean. The Lord uses the rainbow to say, I'm never going to do this again. I'm not going to curse the ground. I'm not going to flood everything. I'm not going to destroy everything. And today man takes it and goes, oh yeah, look at me. You're not going to destroy me, even though I can do whatever I want to. It's not the way it was said. This rainbow has to do with, remember, you're going to go create life. Today, it's used in groups that don't create life. They're, you know, It's a slap in God's face, taking what he's considered to be a sign of a covenant of not destroying, and a group has taken it and slapped it in the face of God as, oh yeah, well, too bad. I really feel that the enemy made sure that that is somewhat of a reminder of no matter how bad, you can't flood the earth. You're not going to destroy. But the Lord doesn't say he'll never destroy. He just says with water. We know it's coming. We know there will be fire. Second Peter um, 3 and there's a few other places, but for sure, 2 Peter 3 lets us know that in the end, we will be with fire and it'll all be made new, just like it was here. Everything's in a cycle. We can't forget that. It says in verse 14, and it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I shall remember my covenant, which is between me and you, every living being of all flesh and never again uh, let the waters of the flood come to destroy all the flesh. And the rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I shall see it and remember the everlasting covenant between Elohim and every living 
being on the flesh, uh, excuse me, and all flesh that is on the earth. And Elohim said to Noah, this is the sign of my covenant, which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Okay. So he's just reiterating again. Um, but in the cloud, that's very important. In the cloud is, well, of course, there's water molecules and, you know, that fly, fly around and the water hits it and the sun hits the water. And then that's how we get the rainbow, right? We, we know this from science and the Lord's revealed how it works. So it's in the cloud. You know, when we go and we look at how the clouds use, that's the Lord's Shekinah glory is in the cloud. When Israel's going through the wilderness, right, the Lord's with them in a cloud, a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. So in the cloud, in his creation, in the cloud, in his glory, he's going to see this rainbow. And that rainbow is going to remind him while looking down, while seeing the chaos, nope, mm -mm, not going to destroy him because I promised. That rainbow is not only a reminder for us as mankind to remember what he's not going to do, it's also a reminder to him. Because he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is a faithful God. He upholds his word no matter what, even when inconvenient, which is what we're supposed to do also. So that, again in verse 15, and I shall remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living being. This is an incredible covenant because there is nothing that man has to do. Because we're going to find out later. Yeshua is going to, I mean, Jesus is going to do it all for us. He's going to stand in the place. But Noah's not told there's anything he has to do. Just go forth and be fruitful and multiply. So I guess that is something he's going to do. He has to go forth and be fruitful and multiply, or else this will be insignificant because, insignificant because there'll be no one to destroy if he decided to do it. But again, he's a faithful God, and he will not destroy the world. Again, with water. Okay, so on that we will end, and then we will start the next part of chapter 9 um, next time I see you. All right, hope you have a great day, and thanks for joining me. Bye.